Welcome to the Stories Are Soul Food podcast, presented by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Okay, welcome to Stories Are Soul Food, episode 666. <laughs> <laughs> We're cruising toward 50, you know? We should just workshop your fun Samson story for... A, oh, did a you finish it? Episode I did. Yeah. yeah, that'd be that. Actually, would be super interesting, but we won't do that yet. No, I know. I we'll feel like it's that. too many spoilers. It's called Noah and the Dreamer's Pen from a franchise I'm building with a friend called The Kid in Me or TKIM. We will talk more about it soon. Yeah, it's a very like noir retro typological thing. Yeah, also very. Um, what's the word? Bible. Yeah. Very, <laughs> <laughs> it's very straight Bible. up. Straight up. It's more allegorical than most of the stuff I do. So. I know, I, but I also felt like you were playing with it. It felt like you were, you were having fun. See, here we are talking about it anyway. We should, we, we're saving, <laughs> we'll skip it. Skip we're it. saving <laughs> Noah and the Dreamer's Pen for some future date. It'll be coming out. It'll be releasing before too long, actually. Oh, I mean, wow. like, I need to spruce up the draft but he's already working on all the illustrations this is a awesome. graphic novel partnership uh that i'm actually quite excited about but because it's a night it's an experiment it's totally experimental and i think it could have some legs but you didn't hear anything yet. yeah but you will hear more later if you are huge fans of noah's and the dream noah and the dreamers pen <laughs> tune in later yeah so yeah a piece of ip that i'm developing that i sent to brian that he just read through so we could workshop we could workshop on an unknown piece of IP at some future date. We will not do that today. Today, we are talking about one of the most, I wanted to hit some fan questions mm -hmm. before we finish out the C.F. Lewis canon. Yep. And Hunger Games. Did we talk Hunger Games today? Um, I, I, we could do some Hunger Games, definitely. I can't remember how much we've talked about before. I think we've touched on your, your yeah, yeah, concerns yeah. with it. No, not concerns. That's such a whiny word. You're just dislike of parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my negative judgment, which has been passed on the Hunger Games and which cannot be appealed. There is no appeal. <laughs> this is the court of Nate. <laughs> yeah, this is a one-stop shop for aesthetic judgment and the Hunger Games. Oh, speaking of aesthetic judgment, yeah. thank you all for all the reviews that are coming in. Nice. We do see them. So, I don't. Nate doesn't. I check them. Every Brian, day I refresh. <laughs> Brian occasionally tells me in episode 48 that there are reviews. Thanks for that. I actually, I will, I will try to take a look. I appreciate the fact that there are people actually listening. That's great. Mm -hmm. And then also the questions you all send in are helpful. So you should send more. Have we talked? So the, the thing is, I've had plenty of people object to my take on Harry Potter and plenty of people object to my take on Hunger Games. And... We can talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the the bedrock, like the the need for truth in world building, like truth mm. in social structure, truth in what actually makes somebody at peace with someone else. I mean, there's so much architecture that is flawed in both of those franchises that it really are. It's it's flawed at the world building level. It's the underpinnings. Of the whole thing. And you've said uh, before that that's one of your, that's where you get really excited. Yeah. You're, you're an engineer type yep. personality when it comes to the world building. That it, it turns out I don't really have an artistic temperament or at least not much of one. I'm a little too bloodthirsty, I think, for the artistic <laughs> temperament. Uh, I enjoy combat and conflict and all sorts of things. And I really like creating things, but my favorite part is the phase of invention. So. Mm invention and building out paradigms and coherence and everything else the actual writing is something i enjoy when it's done mm. and i mean that even on the micro level so like i enjoy a paragraph when it's done. when i've actually finished a sentence and finished a paragraph i'm like oh good i like that now the actual process is not something i am a huge fan of it's not the so does that mean you're you're grinning and bearing it as you go or is it just is that just that's the that's the part you get paid for no do you just do it because the, it means that it's work yep that's all right it's not a bad thing it's work and it's worth it, it needs toil it's, yeah. the, it's the toil part of. yeah it's yeah it's work and it's worth it 
I enjoy keeping the the bullseye in mind as I work. Like I, I know why I'm working. I know to what end I'm working. And I enjoy each little piece that slides into place as it's completed. So the little, the dopamine hit is for me is on any completion level. <laughs> there are people who really love, just love sitting down and cracking their knuckles and just clattering away. And they love that. They love being there in, in the writing. And it's not that I dislike it. It's not. Right. It's just that that's not the thing that, that powers me. What powers me is the, the completion, the thing that's already complete in my head. Nice. And, and, and the conflict. <laughs> yeah. And the conflict. <laughs> The, the skulls, all the skulls that I build into a, a pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> so when I think about world building, I think about the bedrock rules, the stuff that bothers me the most are things that people just don't care about at all. And so things like, does the author of Hunger Games not understand the way people move, socio-political movement? Does she not understand what causes a revolution? No, she doesn't. Well, wouldn't she say that in her world, it can be what she wants it to be? Exactly. And that's, and that is the discussion. So when I push against things like Harry Potter and Hunger Games, and I push against them for completely different reasons often than anybody else does, uh -huh. you know, the, the average consumer, the maternal consumer is like, I don't want my kid casting spells. Right. So we're not, we're not doing this. Or I don't want my kid. In Hunger Games, they'll say it's just, I care, there's a lot of violence. And yeah, that, that's super, the kind of consumer yeah. take on it. So it's, it's super violent. And I don't want my kid thinking about kill or be killed in the backyard with the neighbor kids. Mm -hmm. I'm not bothered by that. I used to be in the backyard playing cannibals with my little sister, you know? Right. And if you haven't had a rock fight, are you even a child? <laughs> yeah. Are you even a child? So <laughs> when, by playing cannibals with my little sister, I mean, we were, we were both running away from imaginary cannibals. <laughs> you know, it's, so he does have limits. <laughs> yeah, I'm not <laughs> pretending to be a cannibal. If I had, I would have gotten in trouble and I think I should have right. gotten in trouble for, you know, wanting to vicariously eat the flesh of man. Because <laughs> um, you're saying you can't write a world where being a cannibal is okay. Right. You cannot write a world where two people can sin against each other and then be fine with each other and totally back in fellowship without that being dealt with. Mm. Like, it doesn't happen. And that's a critique of HP, right? Yep. That's Harry Potter. You don't, you can't do it. And there's a lot of that. I mean, yeah. that part where Ron leaves right. is a good chunk of book. Oh, shoot. I'm mixing up my books now. I read them recently, but. Good the, chunk of one of the books. <laughs> yeah, six. Book six, I think, but. So you have, basically, you have these situations where you say, okay, I have people and these people function on entirely different levels than others. And so in different ways and I've redesigned their psyches. And so now there is no sin and they totally are just at one with each other just by their mere presence mm -hmm. by having come back together. Uh, it doesn't work that way. People build up bitterness and resentment. All that sta static electricity becomes a charge that eventually will be released and there will be a rift that is unbridgeable. Ooh, I had this idea. This, this reminds me of recently, you know, flipping through channels, you saw something like Everybody Loves Raymond or old sitcoms where you have the husband and the wife constantly picking at each other. Yeah, constantly fighting. And then 15, 20 minutes later, the episode's done and they'll be back to normal tomorrow. Yep. But you're right. That's not how marriages work. No, it is not. And so my problem with fiction like that, especially kids fiction, but really any fiction, is that it is a paradigmatic world building problem. Authors have to be wise. They have to be wise, good ones. They have to understand humanity. They have to understand humanity on an individual and collective level. They have to understand what moves families, what moves cities and populations. They have to understand how all the chemistry works in human interaction. The problem is that authors frequently hate it. They hate the way God made the world. And so they are, as part of their own wish fulfillment, changing it. And so they, they shift it and it functions differently. And so it doesn't surprise me, for example, that the Wachowski brothers' imagination that shows up in the Matrix franchise is the same imagination that resulted in uh, one of them announcing that he was trans. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, so, oh, I, oh, oh, you know, like you watch those movies and now, oh, suddenly. Because the mental idea, you can escape 
Anyway, but rise also, above the physical and, there, and you can you can be something different, right, on the core than you and are, and it's really down to you, yep, to choose exactly. What you are. And so you can like the the fixation, the fascination with reskinning, basically, like that. I could I can mm. you know ad- adopt a completely different exterior, and at my soul, in some Aristotelian way, I am truly something other. And so the fact that it is Aristotelian. The fact that it is Aristotle, it's philosophical, it tells you that you're at the architectural level when you're, when you're getting into fiction, when you're getting into storytelling. Then you say, oh man, this is, this is Aristotelianism leading him astray. You know, like, <laughs> this is mm. like yeah, the, down, so the, the downstream, the form. Con- yeah, and the downstream consequences of postmodernism mixed with a thoughtless, ignorant Aristotelianism is a really messy, messy thing. And that shows up in lots of places, but that's an architectural issue. Yeah, Hunger Games okay, is gotcha. an architectural problem. What causes a revolution? So yeah. the, the big, yeah, what does? you know, at the end of the Hunger Games, the first book, two kids threaten to commit suicide. Right. They pick up the poison berries. Yeah. And so we have a teenage suicide pact. And it's public. It's, uh, it's on TV yeah, to the on entire. TV, a teenage suicide pact. And the capital buckles. They are so terrified of that at that prospect that they suddenly like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Like, okay, fine. You're both winners. And it's like, uh, that's. Yeah, I'm trying to remember when you, fr- when you phrase it that way, it does sound kind of dumb. <laughs> no, it's all the way stupid. It's moronic. <laughs> I'm trying a, to remember a, how they it made it a, sound feel bigger. It is a childish and moronic conception of what would actually cause a tyrant to flinch and what would cause everybody who's watching in all the different districts to love her and want to rally around her. In okay, a, that's, in a what it, that's what it is. It's the rallying. They, she so, sort of... A, it wouldn't it? scare any tyrant in the history of the world ever. They, they're fine with two people killing no, themselves, they, even they popular already, people. They already threw teenagers in here to die. So they don't, they're not bothered at all by that. And they add, she adds this little motivation of like, we, ha- we, can't, we have to have a winner. We can't have no winner. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's their flinch. Like they, they, there must be a winner. Like, oh, come on. You really think that when you have death matches that nobody's ever been mortally wounded on both sides? Like this is something that happens, you know, between two combatants historically often. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's ridiculous to, to put them in a position where two teenagers use a suicide pact to back a tyrant down who has already thrust those teenagers into a death match. Right, especially as you go on through the rest of the trilogy, that tyrant is so cold and calculating yeah. and, and violent. Yep. And uncaring, so, yeah. uncaring about all life. It, it, it is kind of silly. on top of that, I, it really bothers me a lot that in terms of a book for teenagers, the weaponization of a threat of suicide as a way to address oppression Ooh. is a horrible, horrible thing to do. That is a horrible thing to do. So when you talk about soul food and you talk about what are you feeding kids, A, you shouldn't murder other innocent people who are sucked into the same horrible oppression that you're in. You shouldn't allow the kill or be killed rules to apply to you. That's step one. B, a suicide pact and a teen novel, Mm. like to get your way. And then also to reinforce that, yep, it worked. (laughs) It's like, oh, like what are so you? Even what though, are you doing? Even though she's on the morally right side, no, well, the, she's at that point. The she's protecting not. her family, isn't she? Kat, no, she's not. Katniss at that point is already completely complicit and guilty. She is. She has blood on her hands. Like that's it. So if you think about, because she's by then she's dropped the bees on. She the has other dropped kids. tracker jackers on sleeping children, mm. who were also uh, shanghaied into this death match. She killed people in their sleep who were other hostages. Yeah. So if you have... She's done the bully thing though. So she makes you forget about that. <laughs> she's turned them into like these sort of video game characters. And when she, <laughs> yeah, one, but one of the worst moments in the book, the, I'm still focusing on the first one, is when she, when her little, her great little friend dies. Re, I think her name is. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, Rue, Re, somebody. Rue. Nope. Ka- Kanga's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, Katniss's little friend is disemboweled with a spear. And while Katniss is sad, 
the narrator tells you that she's actually kind of relieved that she didn't have to do it herself. Mm. That's pretty complicit. Yeah. She's already, she's in, she's bought in. She's bought into this thing. She's and while the kids who are, she dropped tracker jackers on were, were hunting for her. She was not defending herself uh, when she did it. If you, if you jump over to a similar story, dissimilar, similar, you jump over to gladiator and you just, you know, the, the film gladiator is one that I, that I like. And it's not to say that he's not complicit. He is, he is complicit, but at the same time, he is not, he is killing people who are actively trying to kill him. Right. Like that is, he's going to be shoved out there and it's not that he puts his back against the wall and just waits for them to come at him. You know, he, he's killing people who are trying to kill him, but old, his ultimate goal is to rally them all against their shared enemy. And so you see him throwing his sword, you know, up at the, up at the guy in the stands and yelling, right. and entertained and, and he gets all the loyalty of all the gladiators, you know, they are all very loyal to him. So while he exists in this gray area of self-defense, there's definitely complic- you know, complicity there. It's not as stark as the complicity of Katniss. Uh, he is not killing opponents in their sleep, you know, okay, but, before uh, they get put in. But Suzanne, Suzanne Collins would say that that's the point, is that Katniss becomes, she's affected by the system in such a way that she actually does become the antihero sort of of the series as it goes on. And that the video game aspect. Sure. However, comma, what is she serving up? Like yeah. she can she can say that. She can say, well, see, here's here's a way in which I am judgmental of Katniss. It's like, well, actually, what you did is you bonded millions and millions of kids like, with an anti totally and completely you bonded them with deep, deep emotion and loyalty to this girl. And right. They, and and her, her emotional choices, whether yeah. she's going to get with yeah, Gail exactly. or Peta. Yeah, and exactly. And so they- Whether she'll make friends with the crusty old mentor. Yeah. Yeah. You, you take literal tens of millions, I think at this point, in terms of how many she sold, literal t- tens of millions of kids, and you make them absolutely loyal to somebody who is doing these things. Mm. That is just not good. Now, that is not- not good on the skin. That's not good at the bones. That's not good at the architectural level. So you, you're saying, take it full circle, Suzanne can't then say, but in this world that she's in, she has to do this in order to survive. No. Because that's not. Because you actually, so th- think of it this way. God tells lots of stories with lots of horrible things that happen. Mm. All of them in the end glorify him. You know, it's like they, they, in the end, will all manifest his mercy. They'll manifest his justice. They'll manifest any number of things of, of his attributes. We will learn all sorts of things about God. And the actions of fallen man in many of these stories are awful. And they will reveal without, without that, we would not have any atonement. We would have no crucifixion. We would not know the depth of uh, the father's love or of the son's obedience. We wouldn't know any of that. You know, it's like, this is all a narrative that glorifies God in the end. And if you read the Hunger Games trilogy, it does not. Like, so you have changed the rules arbitrarily. And I'm here to tell you that you can't actually. Mm. There are, there are bones of narrative and bones of reality that cannot be changed by an author's whims. Yeah. You cannot write a, a story about a faraway planet in which rape is a positive good and keep it that way. Mm Mm-hmm. You can write a story about a culture in which rape is called a positive good, and then people discover the truth. You can. So that's the Star Trek approach, right? Yeah. Where, As, where you constantly have the baseline of the enterprise explorers yeah. coming across cultures doing different things. Although they yep. try to appear objective with this. Yeah. So there, there, are, there are differences where you say, man, we eat our noodles differently. We might eat our noodles better or worse than another culture. But you can't show up and say, oh, it's really weird how they sacrifice, you know, they, sacri- they capture and sacrifice villagers to their sun god by ripping their hearts out. Huh. That's their culture. Different strokes for different folks. There's a re- there's, yeah, there was a recent <laughs> headline about how the Aztecs were actually woke because they didn't differentiate in their sacrifices between men and women. Wait, it was praising the Aztecs? Yeah. <laughs> for killing as many men. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. That they, they were not sexist in their, their sacrificial choices. 
Oh my goodness. My niece, oh, how are we? I here? didn't read the article. My niece texted this, texted it to me and said, This is actually not a joke. This is a serious <laughs> thing. So I haven't read that article because I didn't want to read that article. That's but funny. It's, or my, so yeah, we, we don't you don't get to go to a place where say you have a, a culture where everybody has to murder their firstborn and put his bones in the foundation of their house. You know, their firstborn son and the bones have to be in the concrete, you know, on all sides. There have been cultures like that. There are there were children sacrificed in the original London Bridge. You know, like this is not a this is not an unknown thing. Yeah, Jericho. Yeah, you sacrifice your kids, and th- this is like your good luck charm is murdering your children in your construction project. You cannot write a culture like that where somebody sacrifices their own child for this and does is totally untouched by guilt. Mm. You just don't. You can't do it. It cannot be done. And it cannot be done because the law of God is written on men's hearts and is done so as authoritatively as any other law. You know, it's like there's no, there's no way around it. You can, you can dodge gravity. You can change gravity. You can change the laws of physics, but you cannot change the laws of morality. You can, in other words, that's a way of saying you cannot change the nature of God himself in your fantasy. Okay. All right. That's interesting. So is in that sense, you think that's more fundamental to who God is. What other aspects couldn't you change here? I mean, I guess I'm reminded if we are going to get to Till We Have Faces, how Lewis attempts to talk about the true God through the means of fake gods. Yeah. Right? No, you can, you can do, there's a lot of things you can do, but what you cannot do is try to fundamentally change morality the way you would change creatures' limbs or gravity or their social structures. Gotcha. So there's a ton of things we get to play with. We can make up beasts. I can put, I can make a rhino tiny and make him built like a basset hound and then give him wings and call him a ragant and stick him in my story. That's fine. But I cannot make murder good. Mm. I cannot make deception bring you holiness. And so that I can have a character who lies, I can have a character who commits murder, and I can have a character who is forced into weird situations where that has to happen, but I cannot have it actually be the kind of thing that gets you a spiritual reward for real. Mm. You know, it's like, I don't, I can't go there. So, and nobody else can either. And so you see that in Potter, uh, but on a more superficial level, and you see that in Hunger Games on a pretty bone deep level. So Harry Potter does it in a lot of, inter, you know, the relationships between characters. And I've said before that she doesn't believe in magic and it's obvious and how she handles magic. You know, it's like she doesn't think of this as a real thing. So she doesn't, she doesn't deal with it carefully. So and yet I, I, I enjoy reading those books. So are you saying magic's one of those fundamental things though? Types of magic. Okay. Yeah, I am. Oh, wow. So, well, I've been wanting to have a whole episode on magic, so we can't go here either. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll do that next. It'll be a discussion of, of magic, appropriate and inappropriate uses of magic and storytelling. Because when you get to these bone level contradictions and you say the same way that it is, it is counted to somebody as righteousness when they sacrifice their lives for somebody, their life for somebody else, when they give a cold drink of water to somebody who's thirsty in Christ's name and you know, it's received by Christ and it's counted as righteousness. In that same way, I'm going to write a world where if you murder somebody in your own family, that you will achieve true holiness. Hmm. And you actually will. Like that's how you become a holy man and the holiness is bestowed. And And that's real holiness. Yeah, it's real holiness. And that is a good person. That you are actually a good person. And that is purity and that is righteousness. And that's not just a weird social thing. Yeah. You you don't get to do that. You don't get to do that with sexual issues. You don't get to do that with murder. You don't get to do that with all sorts of things. And so I think with the Hunger Games, misses, and while she does make Katniss more of an anti hero, she plays out that way. As you know, sort of like the system gets into her and it plays out. I think she painted herself into a corner with it more mm. than anything else. In the first book, if instead, and that because the author is uh, totally omnipotent in terms of being a human over what actually happens and plays out, you cannot tell me that you couldn't do this because an author could do this. If Katniss had actually disarmed wounded, defeated, disarmed other tributes, 
who were trying to kill her mm -hmm. and then had cut out their trackers and dragged them off into caves and saved their lives like and actually united them behind her she would have the undying loyalty of every district where she spared their tribute mm -hmm. so they have their heroes in there and if she actually incapacitates them and can actually just take their life you have that uh, maximus moment in gladiator again where the emperor commands him to murder somebody and he declines and he throws the sword down and walks away it turns his back on the emperor if you do that that is how you start a revolution that is how you get the capital furious with you mm -hmm. that is how you actually get them nervous because as you collect the tributes from these different districts and she would have to kill some of them who just were intractable but they just wouldn't, you know, you'd have to be in self-defense and she would have to be offering them an alliance, mm -hmm. which they're turning down. That would actually define the boundaries of the revolution. If she actually collected those tributes from different districts, she's starting a revolution. Those districts would become very unwieldy for the capital mm. uh, while this game played out. Okay, gotcha. You know, so, and that's the kind of thing where she is still going to deal with guilt in some places she's still going to have to address that guilt and the guilt would have to be addressed the way guilt must always be addressed but she could actually start a revolution i don't think that suzanne actually knows how to start a revolution i don't think she knows how it works i don't think she knows how people work and i don't think she knows how guilt works mm, okay so, just that <laughs> on the page <laughs> right on, on the page it doesn't right. mean that she personally doesn't like just inside the work and i can say yeah in that work i know i read more by her it didn't feel like gregor yeah had I, the I same. actually have not read gregor yeah but it's she can write she knows how to write and she she can write very very disciplined just fast-paced prose yep. she can really motor she can really move uh so it will grab you and it will sweep you up and it will be an interesting ride but don't turn your brain off and don't let your kids turn your brain off now does this mean don't let your kids read hunger games no of course not i actually made my kids read hunger games hmm. so they were disinclined and I made my three older ones do it. And so we could talk through it. And so they, they would be equipped. They would, they would understand it and be equipped to have conversations and equipped to be influences and, in, you know, in their own social group. So can, can we jump to another kid violence book? Yeah. Have you, have you, we've got a question about Orson Scott card and Ender's game. Have you read Ender's game? Yep. Yeah. So there we have another kid who, you know, it's an interesting case study with yeah. that do you have thoughts about that compared with the hunger games ender's game was interesting but it's a gimmicky kind of interesting yeah and it's it falls into the genius child category that i struggle with okay so it's the uh it's really difficult to relate to genius child stories <laughs> <laughs> you know it's here's this wild savant and so you think i'm going to jump to amadeus so the story of Amadeus is really interesting because it's not, it doesn't cause you to relate to Mozart. Okay. So there's a genius. I haven't seen any. There, yeah. are, there are genius children in the world. And Amadeus is the story of a court composer who is the best. You know, he's the best in his nation. And then this giggly little airheaded spaz shows up who is a hundred times better than he is. Mm-hmm without trying because mozart composed his first uh whatever it was at five right yeah so like he was yeah he was a he was a savant genius by three had manifested insane talent and then at five mm. was you know yeah he's just a crazy crazy genius it is very very difficult to relate to or connect in narrative to those genius characters and so that's where ender's game is where there's this kid who's a strategy genius just a mad, mad strategy genius. Mm -hmm. Really, really good at war games, everything else. Mozart in Amadeus, Mozart is this genius musically. And so what, what the filmmaker, what the filmmakers do is they tell the story of the guy next to that guy who wants to be great and is never going to be that great because you can work and you can work and you can get good. But when somebody's really just been kissed by God with talent, that is beyond human levels, beyond normal human levels, it's unrelatable. Yeah. You, we can all relate to having somebody be superior to us. 
<laughs> like, <laughs> and we can all relate to the temptation to resent and be bitter and, you know, and be trapped and consumed with envy and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that is the Amadeus story. In Ender's Game, it doesn't play out that way. You're trying to relate to the genius, and I struggle to do that. Mm. Uh, I don't have a problem with the violence. I think it's an interesting gimmick. And the way they approached it, approached the problem and approached how they kept Ender from being worried about the moral factors is all very interesting. So it's, it's an interesting idea yeah. book, discussion book. If your teenagers want to read it and you want to read it and have a conversation, I think it's a great book for that. Yeah, I'm thinking through it now. Or uh, Orson Scott Card had to work so hard to make him an underdog. Yeah. In order for us not to dislike him. Yep. So we really empathize with him. With They added the vicious bully, one of the yep. worst bullies. Yep. You know, but many of the things that uh, he did, the main character, protagonist Ender does, does seem like you could still do those without having him be a super genius. I wonder if what that would be like. I've only read it once. I've never been drawn to read it again. It's an interesting discussion book. It's mm. not super relatable. I think like Hunger Games is far more relatable. Katniss is mm. incredibly relatable and it's potent for that reason. Yeah. Um, I don't think that kids are going to go off and, you know, kill or be killed, but it's actually quite remarkable. And in the world we're in right now, it's quite remarkable that we have been grooming people for a, for a moment when they'll make all their decisions based on survival. Hmm. So is survival the ultimate good? And in Hunger Games, it is. And you should always pursue survival. Pursue survival and kill if you have to. Pursue survival above all else. And you look at how our country's been run recently, you know, through the whole pandemic, the way people make decisions, they are constantly making decisions in terms of survival being the ultimate good. Uh, and not the survival of the constitution and not the survival of freedom, the survival of whichever individual happens to be closest to the, the levers of power. Mm. And that is so interesting. So we, we are sitting here living in a moment where people are making massive social policy decisions based on uh, survival as the ultimate virtue. And if you think about survival as virtue, that's bizarre. Like surviving is virtuous. Well, it's the only virtue Darwin offers. Yeah, it's the, the only one Darwin can think of. Yeah, it's it just existing. And so we have lots of so what, huge amounts of so what if there are complications, it's not your choice. You know, you, you don't get to make your own decisions for your own, you know, take assuming your own risks. People in power get to take those risks for you based on the likelihood of their own survival and the survival of their peer group. Hmm. And so... Recently, I was reviewing footage from a documentary from a new filmmaker. Uh, we'll see what, what comes of this called Boomers versus Zoomers, like Boomers v. Zoomers hmm. uh, about the pandemic. And one of the things that's really interesting is that Boomers are the wealthiest generation ever. You know, they are retiring with an average fund, retirement fund of 1.2 million. Hmm. On average, they're at 1.2. They're retiring en masse right now, constantly. They are the most at risk to COVID. And they are also the ones in the halls of power right now. The Zoomers are the ones who are the least at risk, currently pursuing their education, far, far away from any power because they're still students, high school and college. And they're having their entire world turned off. Like they're not being permitted to you know, make their own choices, you know, assume their own risks and liabilities for risks. They are having their, their reality turned off. Just like sports seasons, school years, all sorts of things just taken away by a different generation that's more frightened and is more consumed with survival and is more at risk. And so thinking and thinking about a society that becomes obsessed with preserving its 60 and overs, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. And is not actually thinking about the future at all. Not only has there been a massive population decline, a huge, huge vacuums in the labor force, uh, not only will like 20% of colleges struggle to remain open over the next five years because there just aren't enough people because the boomers haven't replaced themselves. Mm. They also are taking the money and retiring and then trying to turn off the economy because they're worried about their own risk profile. And so, 
for those people with much lower risk profiles who are just suffering or being thrown off the back of the sled to the wolves career-wise and future-wise, it's going to create some really interesting, massive generational resentment <laughs> and in terms of narratives. But it's all powered by the same social virtue that powers Hunger Games, which is survival. Survival of what? Survival of any individual and survival of anybody with the levers of power is going to win out. So whoever happens to be in that power position, their survival is going to be ultimate. And that's what we are seeing now. That's why Gavin Newsom can go to parties and not worry about masks as long as everybody else has to. Because mm, he is close to the power. Yeah, he's yeah. close to the power and he gets to preserve every aspect of his own lifestyle, which he thinks he wants to survive while turning off every aspect of everybody else's lifestyle that he thinks puts him and his peers at risk. Mm. Well, that goes back to Aristotle about how you motivate older folks. Yes. It's fear. Fear. <laughs> it is. Fear, fear, fear. Fear that they'll lose what they've got and yep. fear that- And you they... do that whether you're, you're programming MSNBC or Fox News or you're Aristotle. It's yep. fear for the old folks. Yeah. Always fear. So anyway, the, it's odd to me that Hunger Games was huge and was all about this Darwinian survival game. And now here we are. Playing it out. Ta-da! <laughs> how do you like it? <laughs> and also, just like the Hunger Games, there's a walnut shell game where she sacrifices herself at the outset for her little sister. And that is a moment of Christian virtue when she says, take me instead. Right. That's a moment of true virtue. And so that gets a bunch of Christians to bite and then tag along for the rest, which immediately stops being Christian as soon as she's there. We have something similar going on where governments are saying, you may not run your business. You may not support your family. You may not choose what you put over your face. You, you may like, you just may not. And then when you push back at all, they say, love your neighbor. <laughs> like, uh, it's a reverse. You, a reverse. Why can't you sacrifice? Game. Why can't you sacrifice? Isn't sacrifice a virtue? Why aren't you sacrificing? And it works. And so you watch Christians get conned. Now what's the answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I this, you sacrifice. If you sacrifice yourself, that's the situation. Someone, yeah. else, someone else choosing to sacrifice someone else yeah. is not you called a free. sacrifice. <laughs> yes, you are free to sacrifice. You are absolutely free. The kid who is sacrificing themselves to be in the foundation of their parents' building yeah. project is, it's, is... It's not a sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, when you are coerced and forced into sacrificing, there's no, there's no virtue there. And coercing and forcing other people into sacrificing is awful it's horrendous it's an evil not a virtue so There's some play some plays with words there yep. changing of definitions and yep a little and you know like you said shell game shell game moving the walnut shell so anyway i think hunger games is really apropos for our moment because we're getting more and more well we're, we're diving deeper into that world I, th I think we're quite a ways from emerging i think the culture and everything that's being jeopardized and that some people are trying to save and other people are trying to shut down it all the static electricity the thunderheads are growing yeah in our culture they're not shrinking yet well okay so i think you we also we're gonna have people out there who like the hunger i mean i liked the hunger games when i read it in high school i i think i started as it's a it, good read the first yeah. book especially is a good read and then as it went into the series you start to say something's Wait wrong yeah second. yeah exactly but looking back at it i think what people don't realize is that you're emotionally connecting with Katniss and then you're trying to reverse engineer a logical explanation yep. for why it works. Yep. And uh, you, I remember you teaching rhetoric, you drilled the emotions nonstop, that those are proofs. We yep. convince people or persuade people yep. with emotion. And so I think anybody who's listened to this episode and is kind of saying, wait, but I, but like, I love her. And then trying to reverse and be like, no, no, she refused to do this. She had to kill those Tracker Jacker yep. kids because... Because the author said so. Because the because they're gonna get her, you know. Yeah, the author said so, and that's the the weird thing is, we as humans, no matter how many of you out there believe yourselves to be fully rational, we obviously have reason. All of us find ourselves adopting positions because of the affections. We yeah. adopt positions because of the affections, and then we mount logical defenses of those positions. The you know logic comes out to defend the movements of our affections, and a good author like Collins, because she is a good author, she's very talented, can make you deeply affectionate, like really deeply affectionate and bonded to this character. 
right out the gates. It's a visceral experience. It's moving. It's fast paced. Her choices with person and tents and everything else she's doing. Inventiveness of the world. Yeah, exactly. And also the primalness of the world because it's it's inventive, yeah. but also ancient. Like this is an ancient, ancient thing. Yeah. And so the tribute's getting thrown into this place and it's sports culture and wish fulfillment. You're chosen for the reality show. Then the reality show is hell. And then also the, vi- the moral justification of I get to kill people. Like mm. I actually, I get to kill them and I get to not feel bad. Like that's another, there's another little vice tourism piece there that leads people along. But it, it does, I like Katniss, especially early. I have all the affection in the world for Katniss when I'm reading that book. I'm like, yep, well done. Well, I mean, the, then, but the then primal see, urges. But yeah, yeah. But then you have to see the wires and you see the brush strokes and you have to actually watch how it's made and see the shell game and see that, okay, this Katniss that made me really like her is now a different Katniss, is now been swapped in and a, and it's less to do with the skin and more to do, again, with the architecture and the bones of the world. She is, she is taken from a place where she just earned virtue by sacrificing herself for her sister. And then she's thrown into a place where the virtues just changed. Mm-hmm. The author swapped out virtues on you. Katniss is still, in terms of Katniss the puppet, Katniss the character who's being run by an author, Katniss is still Katniss. The rules of the world got swapped. That's where the con happens. The con happens on the foundational level, on the, uh, the architectural level. Hmm. So, and that's where I think she could have been one of the great characters of all fiction for children in a long time if her behavior in the games had been modified and run in a consistently uh, virtuous way, the way she started out. Yeah. Uh, so if she had been more David in there, where there, w- there were moments of guilt, you know, and then she, and she is having to address that guilt, openly and honestly, and ha- then having to behave differently. And I think the way I, the way I would have loved to see her write the story would be for her to cross a line that she never thought she would cross inside the games and then have to deal with how ill she feels, the sickness that she feels, the guilt that lands on her and, res- and actually have a moment of change in her character where she starts down a different path of resistance as a result of having failed, as a result of having been complicit. And I think that would have taken us in a really fantastic direction for the entire trilogy and in, an, in a fundamentally edifying direction. Mm. As opposed to it's, you know, now we do have shows about people committing suicide on Netflix. I can't remember which oh, yeah, one that 13 was. 13 Reasons Why. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, stuff is- It's just that emotional thing reduced to a show for- Yep. And suicide's an enormous problem nationwide and right. getting worse. With every new shutdown, with every delay, yep. stuff is getting worse. And yeah. so basically, if you really like Katniss, lay down the emotions for a second and think about what would make you like her better. Yeah. What would make her holier? What would make God like Katniss? What would make God say, well done, mm. Katniss, about her behavior in the games? And then, you know, see if you can thread that needle. Because if you could thread that needle creatively, then it becomes not just a well-written book, not just a fast-paced book, but it becomes a really, really potent book which tells the truth. Yeah. And I just, by the by, I just saw the BBC article about uh, nonviolent revolutions. If there's 3.3.5% of the population involved, almost always are always succeeding within modern history. You know, so it's not huge numbers of people we <laughs> yep. need to talk about, but uh, yep. it, it, with that sort of convincing works, little leaven through the whole dough. So there we go. We ta- we've talked about Hunger Games a little bit before. There you go again. That's the Hunger Games episode. Yeah. But also, not just Hunger Games, that's for a lot of books. It's a way I view a lot of what I read is looking at the architecture, the engineering of the bones and the bones of virtue. The bones of virtue are what actually ends up in fleshing your heroes or your anti-heroes and, make, and making you figure out which things you should love and which things you should hate and which characters you should actually be loyal to. Yeah. That's a wrap. There we go. Peace out. This episode has been brought to you by New St. Andrews College. Over the last century and a half, American tyrants have been carrying out a slow, methodical disarmament that no one is talking about. State education. If you want your student to mature in their faith, be armed for battle, and equipped to fight tyranny, apply at nsa.edu slash fall2022. That's nsa.edu slash fall2022.